I'd like to introduce our moderator for this panel. I've interviewed Tobias now a few times on the Planet Microcap podcast, and he really has a very insightful way of looking at the financial world. And he just happens to also be an Australian expat, so we thought he would be perfect to moderate this panel to talk about what the Australian microcap ecosystem really ha uh, looks like. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Tobias Carlisle from Acquirers Fund. Good morning. G'day. I'm very happy to, uh, to be moderating this panel. I spent half my career as a lawyer in Australia doing capital raising and in the States, and I've spent the second half as, a, as an investor in Australia and the States. Uh, there's a lot to recommend Australia as an investment destination. Uh, very strong rule of law, politically stable, very deep capital markets. Uh, highest rate of direct share ownership in the world by uh, virtue of this uh, super fund, which is like a 401k pension, uh, and Australians love to gamble, so they love uh, small speculative stocks. Um, that's not what we have up here today. Uh, this is sort of uh, one of the unique things about Australia, that there's no secondary board, so companies list on the ASX listing regime is a little bit easier in Australia than it is here, so you see companies list earlier. It's a little bit more like listed VC or listed private equity, which is the way microcap investing should be. Um, joined by several listed companies up here today, James Kellett, who's the executive chairman of Neopets. Neomedia, Neo I'm sorry, Neomedia. <laughs> I got the James right and I got the Neopets wrong. <laughs> Leslie Chong, who's the chief executive of Imugene. And Rick Revlins who's the executive director of First AU. Um, perhaps we can start with you, James, given that you've had the, uh, you've got the nearest, most interesting news. What, what does Neo Media do? Thank you, Tobias. Neo Media is, uh, as Shelley introduced before, is a uh, ASX listed company, and we're the publishers of Neo World, uh, which is a very extensive and highly sophisticated online games-based learning platform. It's quite some years in development. Um, the platform is now evidenced and uh, university research-based. And it maximises student engagement. Uh, and in maximising the, engage the engagement, we're then able to better educate those, uh, those students. We're also able to better assess the students. And we do it across uh, six categories, where most educational products are limited to one. We do it across six categories, which is literacy, numeracy, arts, science, reasoning and memory. And, we sell uh, on a business-to-business -business model, if you like. It's on a seat license basis uh, into schools and to school districts. And we cover uh, K to eight uh, in a regular uh, education, uh, but also we have alternative assessment for special needs. And we do a lot of work in special needs education as well. And obviously we have a wider range and assessment uh, uh, scope for those, for those students. Although we're listed on the ASX, it's, it's rather interesting that we started life here in the US and our first, uh, first business operation started in San Francisco. We subsequently moved to New York and uh, from that time forward started to sell into uh, New York City Department of Education, New York State, now Arizona, Ohio um, and Florida. Uh, but with education, it's, it's a long sales cycle. But once we achieve the sales cycle, then we really become quite embedded in the system. Um, over time, we've also developed operations in um, London uh, for the UK, uh, Philippines, and also back in Australia. You might ask why Australia last, and that's largely because it's such a small market. So we do remain very heavily focused on the US market here, and our main, uh, main operations uh, are here, based here in the US. And that's why, uh, really out of demand, uh, we're delighted to be able to get the OTC listing because we've had uh, numerous requests for, uh, from US citizens to invest in uh, Neo Media. But uh, as you're probably most all aware, it's, it's not an easy process to then go and open an account, a brokerage account in Australia. So the OTC market, I think, is, uh, is perfect for us. And it provides opportunity for investors in the US to participate in what's both a, now a, a mature uh, investment, uh, but it's also a very ethical investment. James, we'll, we'll uh, just, Leslie, um, 
Imugene, the, the main business of Imugene is uh, cancer curing. Yep, so uh, my name is Leslie Chong, and thanks for uh, attending this nice little panel here for me to speak. So um, I think I'm the only one that actually flew in from Australia yesterday and was caught up at nine hours in SFO for the Las Vegas storm, but here I am today looking semi-refreshed um, after a good sleep. So my company specifically is a biotech company listed in the Australia as IMU, and we're specifically in uh, immunocancer therapies, meaning we use your immune system to attack a, a particular kind of cancer. We have already gone through several levels of clinical trials, and we have data. And Ultimately, what we would love is to partner with um, my former company, Genentech, or Pfizer's, or GSK of the world, and we have amassed um, such a great scientific advisory board to help me to develop our products, and we're at that stage um, where we are maybe almost nearly too big for Australia, and so we'd like to come more onto the U.S. stage, so that's why I'm here today. And uh, Rick, first AU. First AU. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. And uh, I'm, I'm here wearing a couple of hats. One is First AU, which is a small cap Australian gold uh, exploration company. We only listed on the ASX about 10 months ago. And already we've, we've had a, a brand new gold discovery, which is very, very exciting. And uh, it, what's even more interesting is we found it in an area which is Australia's most prolific gold production area. You may or may not know this, but Australia is the world's second largest gold producer behind China. It accounts for about 10% of the world's gold. And the four largest gold mines in Australia are all in Western Australia. And the area that we're now involved in, and we're in the process of announcing our first, what you'd call NI43101, resource, we call it Jork in Australia, it's pretty much the same thing. So we're in the process of delivering that, that first resource. And I guess my, my other hat is that um, I'm a serial investor and investment banker, and I've been involved in international markets, and I've listed dozens and dozens of companies on the Australian Exchange, I've dual listed companies on NASDAQ, TSX, the AIM market, and I've been working lately with, with a number of Australian companies, and some of them are here and some of them are still in Australia, about dual listing on the OTC. And that was seen as a, a way of creating an introduction to the biggest capital markets in the world, and particularly for companies which have a, a US basis or a US reason. Uh, it makes a lot of sense for those companies to seek a dual listing, particularly on the OTC, QB and the QX. Leslie, you've got an impressive uh, advisory board, scientific advisory board. Would you like to speak to that? Sure. So, um, having worked at GSK, Exelixis, and Genentech, um, I'm quite used to working with scientists and oncologists and um, alike. And when I moved to imaging, one of the things that I noticed right away is you need the scientific backbone. We're producing an anti-cancer product, and we're hoping to, at, at some point, alleviate some patients of their you know, malignant disease. And so you need world-renowned scientists to help you to develop these products. And I'm happy to report that um, some of them followed me to Imugene. And so we have the president of what's called um, an American Association of Cancer Research on our board, as well as uh, his name is Michael Caligiri. He's also the president of City of Hope um, Cancer Center. And we also have um, Yobzev Tabonero, who is the, uh, the president of the European Society of Cancer Oncology. And so what that means is these two scientists, they're oncologists as well, they have seen every single product go through their clinical trials, and they know exactly how those are affecting their patients. So I get wonderful real-life experience as well as the expertise of having them being in such a high, profound roles in these settings. James, uh, how big do you see the market opportunity for Neo Media, Neo World, and how much have you captured? What, what does the competition look like? The market opportunity is really represented by the population of the elementary students in the, in the US, and that's something like 23 million students. We also have a niche uh, with uh, students with additional needs, and uh, uh, some of those might purely be slow learning, English as a second language, or more genetic issues. 
Um, and that represents somewhere between 12 and 15 per cent of the population. So we have that niche market, uh, but also we can look at 23 million and uh, say, well, there's, we know at least 2 million are in that niche market, but really the whole of the elementary um, population is, is our market. We, um, I, I, I'm not going to be so bold to say that we don't have competition. I think we have a unique offering that we're able to deliver on one platform um, the six key core components of the curriculum. So there's, there's many products out there in general education that you all have heard of, such as mathletics, and quite simply, it deals with maths. And the issue for a teacher in a school, in a school class is not to be burdened with trying to change programs, log kids on, log kids off. Uh, what you need to deliver is something that lightens their load. And what we've been able to do with that platform is put very extensive analytics at the back of it. And to take it to the extreme, how do you assess a non-verbal child? How do you assess many of the children when you've got them in, in the classroom? Uh, simply by going through our games-based learning platform that is um, uh, adjustable for all levels of, of uh, learning, um, these uh, analytics provide a progressive score on just how the, the child is, is progressing, um, both in terms of the class and in terms of where they should be in the, in the standards. So I think they're the key differentiators for us. Rick. Uh Mining companies typically require a lot of capital, but you guys are, how are you funded and do you, do you foresee any near-term capital raising? Well, uh, it's all about stages and mining is really very similar to areas like biotechnology because there are steps and funding steps and as you move along these steps, your funding either appears or it disappears depending on how well you do and the quantum of funding changes. And at early stages of exploration, uh, you, you're running programs somewhere, you know, three hundred to five hundred thousand dollars a program. At the later stages, at, and like later stages of clinical trials, uh, they increasingly get more expensive up until the point where you get into production, and that becomes not just uh, an equity raising exercise, but debt and so forth, and all those sorts of things. But first, are you at this stage? We're we're a junior company. Um, we're, we're a new company with an exciting new discovery and uh, we're hoping that's going to turn into something quite significant. Leslie, uh, immunotherapy for cancer is not new. That's available around the world. What, what is unique about what Imogen does? So relatively in 2011, the first sort of real checkpoint inhibitor immunotherapy came out on the market and it was uh, that particular study the registrational study was led by Dr. Axel Hoos, who is currently on our board of directors and he's currently the senior vice president of GSK. So we've got this profound leader in the field um, heading up our company in a lot of ways. And he was traveling between his time at Bristol Myers Squibb and now to GSK and he founded the science at the Medical University of Vienna, was, a, was quietly you know, quietly interested, um, tapped the shoulders of my now chairman, Paul Hopper, and then he parlayed it into a company, and I joined roughly in 2015 to, uh, to develop the product. So he, what Axel believes is that in cancer therapy, we have just hit the iceberg in immunotherapies, immunocancer therapy specifically, and whereby a lot of the other companies are still sort of in that checkpoint inhibitor space where you enlisted T cells, which are great. You need your T cells to really wipe out a disease um, such as cancer. We also think that B cells could be enlisted as well, and we have just um, completed a robust phase one study just to prove that, and we have other things in our pipeline against uh, certain kinds of various different cancers like lung or breast or gastric, and we like the B cell approach because to date we've not seen any level of side effects, no toxicities with our product, which is unheard of in an era where cancer patients are having to go through radiation oh. and chemo where they're basically near death and then brought to life by other immunotherapies. We by have been able to serve these patients without causing any level of toxicity. So we're really interested in furthering this approach of immunotherapies. And so that's the major difference. We can create the likes or similar like um, efficacy as say a, say a T cell um, therapy, but via your B cells, we're able to also 
be able to be that com combination of choice because we don't bring any toxicities into, uh, into a combination and still affect the tumors. James, uh, you alluded to this earlier, but there's a, a long sales cycle when you're selling into government. H how do you want investors to think about, m measure the performance <coughs> of Neomedia as you progress through that cycle? Tobias, uh, it is a two-year sales cycle, um, or longer, and uh, in each jurisdiction we do need validation, and that's done from a, a, a bottom-up approach, specifically in schools and also from local universities. Um, in each of the jurisdictions we're in, the universities do collaborate internationally, and that's why we've chosen those particular countries that we're, we're involved in. But I think the good thing about Neo Media is that we've really deployed a lot of that uh, initial time and uh, there's some years under our belts. So we're now really at an inflection point and we're seeing our revenue start to grow now. So much of the concern about whether we, we're constantly an R&D business or whether we have a, a mature platform uh, has been taken away. Uh, the platform is developed, it is validated, it is active, and, and what's more, we have um, more, uh, more material available to continue to build on the platform, um, probably twice than what we've already published. So uh, we do have a long-term uh, view of the validity of the platform, uh, but our R&D is complete. Uh, Rick, what, what, what are your expectations for the, the length of time to develop the, the, the project to generating cash flow? Yeah, it's very hard to comment on that when you're at an exploration stage because uh, you, you're really not sure what you have in the ground until you complete your drilling, your phases of drilling, and you prove whether the project's economic or not. So we, we're still in that stage where we're trying to work out exactly how much resource we've got. Uh, we're doing metallurgical test work to see how well um, it, it, it mills and what the expected costs of that would be. Uh, but it's still probably quite a few years away before we get into production on that particular project. We've got other projects that we have uh, mining leases over that are probably uh, far earlier within the development phase to get those into production. Um, so, uh, the, I guess the reason why, why we, we're here is, is really because the, the US is such a large investment market. And from an investor's perspective in the US, you're finding that there are less companies going public than there used to be. And what that means is that you're finding the public com companies at a far later cycle of development than you probably would in Australia. We tend to float things, as you said in your opening remarks, a lot earlier than they do in other parts of the world. And I think what that does, it really offers a lot of opportunity to investors that rather than waiting until something gets to that critical stage where it's uh, producing revenues and profits and things, there's an opportunity to get in much earlier. And generally, the valuation jumps are at that very early stage until uh, the company gets to a profitable record. And that's where you get the, the biggest increments in value. Um, Leslie, can you speak to a little bit about where you guys are in the uh, approval process uh, and how long that runway usually is? So usually a cancer product takes anywhere between um, 15 years to 20 years to develop. <clears throat> but however, immunotherapies have really pushed those boundaries. Just recently, a product called Catruda was approved within a five-year development path. And for us as a small biotech company, what we eventually look for is partnerships. So we can develop a product on up till phase one or phase two and have a proof of concept or have that really interesting data points. And this is when you start engaging the bigger farmers that will take it and then market the product. So of course, um, I have experience developing phase three and then marketing the product. That consists of uh, going out finding 200 people to come and market your product. Um, I did not enjoy that process <laughs> particularly, so I would like to continue to develop my product on up till we can get a partner with bigger pharma companies. Uh, Rick, is there, what, what else should investors know about uh, First AU? Uh, look, we've got a, uh, an article in the magazine for those of you who are inclined in the resources space and, and I, I guess there aren't that many resource investors here today looking at people's CVs and what they're looking at. Uh, but uh, again, it gets down to the quality of the people and we have an excellent exploration team, highly experienced. Uh, we've got a chief geologist who's a PhD in geology. Uh, the other people around our group 
they've won between them, I think, three Explorer of the Year titles. Uh, so they're very well credentialed. They've had a high degree of success. Our group's taken companies before from 10 million market cap to 4 billion. Uh, I was the chairman of Australia's fourth largest iron ore company, uh, a company called Atlas Iron. I was also the chairman of a company called Gold Road Resources, which has capped around $5 billion. Uh, I'm not on the board now, but it was, it was good company when we had it. And so uh, I think from, from, from our, um, our process here, we, we've got really good quality uh, projects, uh, very experienced, very well credentialed team, and uh, a, a market that's very supportive of, of mining projects in, in our country. We've got 2,400 companies listed on our stock exchange. Uh, over a third of those are mining and exploration companies and energy companies. So a large proportion of our ASX index is comprised uh, of the mining sector. James, uh, can you speak a little bit to the, the technology back end and, and how that was developed for, for the firm? Uh, yeah, it's been developed over a period of years now. It's uh, really been a trial and error. Uh, we started out in the smaller app space, which was very limited capacity. Uh, we're a, we are a SaaS business. We're, we're online. There's no way you could deliver the amount of content that we have um, through, a, through a regular app. Um, we also host through Amazon uh, Web Hosting, which gives us um, mirror services in Singapore and Sydney in the UK and Seattle here for the, the US. Um, the other thing about being online, we've got um, uh, immediate access to the, uh, the analytics as wherever the students are working, whether they're working at home, whether they're working in the classroom, there's immediate uh, analytical um, data available for the educators. Um, and the, the platform runs on any device and um, um, probably compressed rather well it's, as long as there's reasonable connectivity. Uh, I might open it up to questions. Uh, if anybody has any questions, then... James, um, what do you think is the tipping point of your technology and the acceptance of it, and which um, population in, in the sector would be most apt to adopt your software first? Shelley, we've... Um we followed a long path, starting with um, sort of a, from a bottom-up approach, and funding is always difficult for educators. Uh, we've you know, we've had to battle to uh, as much as many of the many of the um, schools and districts wanted the platform. They didn't have uh, funding available for it. Uh, we had a tipping point a couple of weeks ago uh, when the state of Florida approved our platform for federal government title funding. So that doesn't mean that they automatically distribute it to every district, but what it does mean that every district we approach, and there's 67 districts in, in Florida, um, that there's funding automatically available. So that's a, that's a huge step forward for us. California and Texas follow the identical model, uh, where it's top down uh, from a state down, it's controlled from the state level. The other states tend to be more district uh, decisions made at the district level. So I think that's, um, that's a very, very significant step in, um, in our path forward here in the US. Um, obviously, we're concentrating on the higher population areas, uh, the likes of you know, Chicago and, um, and areas such as that. Uh, so the bigger cities tend to be where we're, we're mostly involved. But um, we're now progressing um, across a number of states. So it's, uh, it's a pretty exciting time for us. Uh, this is for James again. Uh, can you please explain your licensing model a little bit? Sure. It's, uh, it's a seat license per student. Uh, it's $50 per student per year. And the, the important thing to recognise is that every student must have a licence, otherwise the uh, data would be contaminated. So from a commercial aspect, you know, it's a positive thing for us that you can't pass the licences across to different students. Uh, we found that $50 a student for what they get is, is incredibly reasonable. And once we're embedded in, uh, we're finding we've got renewals now, so we've got annuity income which is really what we, our business model was to get in, become embedded and have annual renewity income as we grow. Got it. So this $50 is renewed annually? Yeah. Okay. Got it. Yep. James, could you um, first address a little bit of the students that are enrolled in the program? What are you finding as the result of your program? 
I think the most significant thing that we found is the engagement we've been able to achieve. And Monash University, uh, which is a, you would not have heard of it, it's a highly acclaimed uh, university in uh, Melbourne with a uh, highly acclaimed education faculty, uh, did a very extensive research program on students. And they found they got, when they were involved with the platform, they had a 97% engagement. So you're talking about kids that are involved for something virtually right across the board. Once they're, in, once they're involved, they're engaged, they learn better. Now, games is the oldest form of education, the oldest form of learning. It's been around forever. When they're using games-based learning, they're actually learning, they're going through, they're having fun, they're enjoying it. And what we can now uh, measure is the progress of the, of the, for the student or the class as they, as they work their way through the platform. And whether that typically in maths and literacy, which are the two of, that rate the, the lowest, um, I often rate it, you know, the lowest scores. Uh, places like Buffalo and Rochester have got incredibly low uh, scoring levels in maths and literacy compared to um, other cities. Um, we can now measure with our platform and, and see an increase in the, the performance. And the most important thing is those teachers are all judged each year on what they've been able to achieve with their class. So if they're using the NEO platform and they're getting an increased score, uh, it's a very positive outcome for both what, of us. What are you finding with um, kids that are special needs, whether they have Asperger's or... or that's, uh, that's been one of our most um, exciting areas that we've worked in. Uh, we've done a lot of work with kids with uh, autism, which, as we all know, the, num the numbers are growing dramatically. Um, incredibly, you know, one in 65 boys now in some areas have been identified with, with autism and there's certainly earlier intervention. But what we're finding again is the engagement. We've taken uh, kids that have been, uh, that, that exhibit what they call behaviour of concern. Quite simply, they're hitting someone, they're biting someone and they're quite uncontrollable and we've been able to get them engaged on the platform. They become completely uh, engaged and we start to educate them. And I could give you first-hand examples I've seen in classrooms that kids that were just literally uncontrollable, suddenly involved, and not only are they involved, they're also involved with their peers and assisting their peers. That was also something that Monash was able to determine, that the interaction between these kids when they're engaged uh, absolutely reduced the uh, behaviour of concern, which is a real oh and issue in those schools. You know, teachers are often, often hurt. You know. Rick, can you talk just a little bit about your core drilling program? where you're at with it, have you started results or whatever the program is? Yeah, look, it, it, it's, it's fairly involved and you'll find all the recent drill results in the MicroCap Review magazine. Uh, but we've had some really high grade hits. We've had uh, up to 462 grams per tonne over three metre intersections, which works out at about 16 ounces for people who live in America. And uh, it, it, we've, we've run uh, a number of programs since we started uh, in June of last year, and each program has been significantly more and higher a grade than the program before it. And we know where we're going because there are a lot of structural units that are running from the adjoining tenements where, the, where they've been mining, and we've followed that geology into, into, our, um, into our tenement areas and following these high-grade mineralised zones. So um, we're working on our following program coming up very shortly. We're just waiting to complete our initial resource estimate, which will be in compliance with the Australian standard jaw code, and also a lot of metallurgical test work to determine what the best process for, for extraction and mining would be. Yes, Les, um, what, what phase are you currently at? Um, phase one of um, trials or phase two? So I want to thank you for that question. <laughs> um, so we're currently in phase 1B. Oh, actually, we've completed the phase 1B. We're in phase 2. So we have two products in phase 2, and then we've got another product coming into phase 1. I was wondering if each one of you could maybe talk about running your company, um, some of the toughest challenges you had to face. Maybe you can pick out one challenge and how you, how you met it and how you solved the problem. <laughs> I've got many. Yeah. Pro I've got I'm many to problems think which to think about. Challenge is actually most relevant. <laughs> um, I think as a small company in the, in the U.S., one of the challenges we've had is been getting uh, is been uh, hiring 
high caliber people. Uh, when you're a small company, uh, particularly when you're owned offshore, uh, that's certainly a challenge because uh, people are looking for job security. Uh, they're looking for the larger companies on their CV. And it's only more recently, and, and whilst we've always been you know, very much an American-facing company from the day we started, um, it's only more recently we've been able to start to hire that people of that, that calibre. And of course, then nothing succeeds better than success. So uh, that's been the biggest challenge. So that's a really good interview-like question. Um, <laughs> didn't we get all that when you get interviews? They say, well, what's your biggest challenge and how'd you meet it? And, and mine's always been, um, I'm, an, I'm a workaholic. I don't know life, work-life balance. Um, and it's still too true to this day. My personal hardship had been, I've only been in the clinical development side. And then having to come on to a company whereby I had to start raising funds and, and learning the investment um, climate, and that's been a, a bit of a challenge, and it still continues to be that way for, I've been a CEO now for three and a half years, but I, it's getting a little bit easier because I've been able to bring funding into the company because the data has been showing itself. Uh, the challenges of my particular technology is that there is no like technology out there. So I can liken it to a very successful product like Cotruder, Opdivo, that's $8 billion a year. However, our approach is so different because those uh, particular drugs have a side effect, a pretty toxic side effect. We want to produce a like product but because I don't have a sister or brother that looks like that out there, that's been a, that's been a hard to compare as well, as well as evaluate. So I think those are the challenges. But for me, if I continue on that clinical development path, get the data to say, yes, it's like that product but better, that's where I need to go and I'm very focused on that. Yeah, I think probably for the, the business that I run, uh, I run an investment bank out of Australia, and so we're always looking at different companies and different sectors, and you, you can't be all things to all people, so we specialise mainly in, in biotechnology, technology and mining. And it's like any other market, uh, you, you, you're, if, if you're not a big company with established revenues, you, you're always at kind of at the mercy of what the market's doing at that time, and you might be going out to, to raise money for a particular project, and the market's just not conducive. And I think probably the best, the best thing to do is, is surround yourself with very competent and good people. And that's what I've found. I've, I've been bringing a number of companies here to the US to list on the OTC. And the people we're working with, particularly the guys from Glendale up the back, thank you very much for getting through an OTC listing in less than a week. Unbelievable. So very pleased. And it's all about surrounding yourself with, with really good people and uh, people you can trust. Thank you. Hello, guys. Uh, James, Wesley, and uh, Rick. Good day, mate. Yeah, <laughs> I'm training in Perth, but uh, I'm also a Perth resident in Melbourne. So uh, I picture right. Perth, 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 <laughs> Perth accent. I've got a question for, for James. James, uh, it seems that you're, you're in the SaaS uh, domain, right? In the, uh, your platform is, is SaaS-based, subscription method, isn't it? Right. Uh, what is the number? My first question: What is the stickiness of uh, most of your accounts? For how many years? In the last five years, what has been the stickiness? And number two, my next question is about the reasons why you brought to North America. It infers that your product is cross; it can be used by the American uh, populations as well. But if had it not been that way, would it st would you still come to North America to, to raise funds? So that's my second question. Right, the first question, how sticky is the, uh, uh, is the platform? Uh, we're seeing renewals. We're not seeing anybody um, decline. Um, so I think that's the fundamental answer. And as we're at early stage of really of sales, um, and we've, we've had a number of ambassador schools that we've been working with to achieve that validation, and they continue to renew with us. So uh, we don't think we're seeing any drop-off rate, but we've certainly... Um, use those ambassador schools to work with them and further validate and develop the platform. So they've become partner schools with us and now we're in uh, more commercial transactions. I think you probably have to wait another two years to answer, ask that question again. And your second question was, what, would we come to North America from Australia? Is, is it because that you have a shared market with, with the American population? Yeah. Had it not been there, would you still come to North America? 
Would I come to North America if I didn't have uh, an operation here? Would I come to the investment market if I didn't have an operation here? I think it would certainly be challenging. <coughs> um, <coughs> excuse me. I think it would be challenging. Um, however, on the other hand, and we touched on this earlier, Australia's venture capital market is really um, its VC market. There is virtually no venture capital market, as, 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 as we know, there. So the early listings on the ASX is the... The VC market. What that affords investors is the opportunity to get into emerging companies at a far lower valuation, rather than as typically occurs here, where you've got a company that reaches 100 million revenue or larger before it lists on NASDAQ at a high valuation. The retail investor doesn't get a crack at that along the way, but in Australia they do from day one. So um, that's, the, that's the advantage for the investors to go into Australian companies and probably the reciprocity is that the Australian companies will continue to look for those, those investors. But Folks, uh, that's coming to the end of the time. Uh, thank you very much. For full disclosure, I don't own any shares in any of the companies on this panel.